Amen. So we're in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to pick up things at the last half of Acts chapter 2. So last week we went through on the day of Pentecost, that great miracle um, where God um, gave the ability um, to the apostles to speak all different languages or all different tongues, as the Bible says, so they could preach the gospel um, to all the different people that were here in Jerusalem at um, this time. So we're going to pick things up at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 22, where Peter stands up and starts, basically what he starts preaching is preaching Jesus, okay? Look at verse number 22 of Acts chapter, verse number 2, verse number 22 of Acts, I don't even know what I'm saying right now. Verse number 22 of Acts chapter 2, okay? Ye men of Israel, hear these words. This is Peter talking. And, you know, you remember everybody says that, oh, these, these men are drunk, and they're, 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 and he's like, no, they're not. Peter gets up and he rebukes them. He says it's the third hour of the day. And he says, now he just starts like preaching the gospel to these people, saying, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So Peter comes out of the gates swinging right here. He comes out and he basically just says, look, he's like, you know, Jesus was the Messiah, idiots. That's kind of what he's saying. He's like, Jesus was the Messiah, this guy, you know, that you all thought was false and all this and wouldn't believe. He was the Messiah and you killed him. He basically comes out and calls them murderers. Um, right away. Look at Psalm. Go to Psalm chapter 16. So he basically comes out preaching Jesus, okay? But then, right away, he goes into something new, okay? Look at Psalm chapter 16, or go ahead and go to Psalm chapter 16 as I keep reading um, in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, in verse number 25, Peter now starts getting into some deeper, deeper ideas and deeper doctrines concerning Jesus, and he says, for David speaketh concerning him. So he's saying, he's saying at the first three verses, he says, you know, this Jesus of Nazareth who you killed, he's like, he was the Messiah. He's like, God knew this was going to happen, and God raised him from the dead. He's like, you didn't succeed, but you killed the Messiah, he says in the first three verses. And then he says, even David spoke of this Messiah. He says, and he starts talking about things that King David, whom all you know, the Pharisees and the religious leaders are su supposedly know so much about um, King David, they actually kind of wanted Jesus to be like King David when you think about it that way. But look at verse 25. He says, For David speaketh concerning him. Now he's really getting their attention. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad, Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So verse number 27 there, he's talking about um, a soul, and then he's talking about a body. Okay, so he's talking about the spiritual and the physical in that one verse. And then he's saying, David said this, okay? He says, David spoke these things, specifically in chapter or verse 27, he says, David says, and if you read this, and if you've never read the New Testament, and you read this in Psalm 16, this will confuse you, okay? If you read the Old Testament, you know, knowing nothing of the New Testament, or if you can kind of put yourself in that mindset, you know, I kind of try to put myself in that mindset when I'm reading the Old Testament, just like, okay, you know, what if, you know, what did these people know at this time? What did they think at this time? And this is a, this is a, a, a puzzling statement from King David because he says, thou will not leave my soul in hell. And we know King David is a saved man. We know King David um, was, was loved of God. We know King David is in heaven. So King David says, because thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will suffer thou a holy one to see Corruption. He's talking about Psalm 16 and verse number 10. If you're there, look at verse number 10 of Psalm 16, where David says these exact words. He says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Who is David talking about here? If you just had the Old Testament, you would think, you know, David's soul? You would say, he's going to hell? What, what, what's going on? You know, the holy one? David's not the holy one. 
You know, you have to wonder what's going on. But then Peter gives us clarity in verses 28 and 29. He says, thou hast made known to me, though, in verse 29, let's read verse 28 first. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, continuing um, David's prophecy, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. And then Peter explains it in verse 29. He says, men and brethren, he says, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So in verse number 27, we're talking about a soul, and a body, okay? So we're talking about a physical body. So the body will not suffer corruption. It will not, it will not decay. It will not rot, so to speak, okay? And in, in the first part, we're talking about a soul being in hell, okay? But he says, he says now he, he addresses the body. He says this, he's basically saying this can't be about David, he says, because he's both dead and buried, and his sepulcher, his tomb, his grave, is with us today, he's saying. He says, we could go to King David's tomb right now, and we could see his body that has decayed. He says, in verse number 30, he explains it further. So he's basically saying, this cannot be about David. He says, therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So he references a, a few things here. He says, David was a prophet. He says, and God swore to him a promise. You know, the, the Messiah would come from the fruit of his loins. What he's talking about is go ahead and turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. He's talking about um, the messianic promise that was given to David. Now, it, was, it was first brought up in 2 Samuel chapter 7. It's summarized very nicely in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. You can also find it in 2 Chronicles. But in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, it, the messianic promise to David is summed up. If you look at verse number 11 of 1 Chronicles chapter 16, we can see the messianic promise that Peter is talking about here. So Peter says, David's a prophet. He says, God swore to an oath to him that the Messiah would come, the Christ would come from his um, flesh, from his throne. Okay, look at verse number 11. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass, when thy days be expired, that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me in house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son, and I will not take away my mercy from him, as I took it from him that was before thee but I will settle him in mine house in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forevermore. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, the prophet Nathan tells David this for the first time, saying, because David wanted to build the temple, remember? David wanted to build the temple, and Nathan says, no, your son's going to build the temple. He's like, oh, by the way, the, Mess the Messiah is going to come um, from you. You know, your throne, your reign, your throne will reign forever, meaning Jesus Christ takes that into eternity, okay? So David knew that the Messiah was coming from his, as the Bible says, the fruit of his loins, from his bloodline, so to speak. That's why you see in the lower kingdom of Judah, and if you look at the history of the lower kingdom of Judah versus the kingdom of uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel is just a mess of dynasties, there's just dynasty after dynasty after dynasty. Dynasty meaning families that run the throne. In the lower kingdom of Judah, it's always son of a son of a son of a son of a son, all the way through to the Babylonian captivity, which continued even hundreds of years later to the birth of Christ, if we look at the genealogy. So God kept his promise, okay? But we learn a few new things here. We learn a few new things here from Peter. We learn that, number one, David was a prophet of God and that God showed him things. God showed David things. Okay, when he said Psalm 16, when, when David spoke Psalm 16, he was speaking about Christ, not himself. Look at verse number 31. He's seeing this before. He's talking about David. He says he, because he was a prophet. He said, he seeing before, this before, spake of, he's talking about Psalm 16:10, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul, Christ's soul, was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Now Psalm 16.10 makes sense. Okay, it didn't make sense that David went to hell. It makes sense that Christ's soul went to hell. Now it makes perfect sense. So this is the doctrine, this is the, the core doctrine of Jesus' soul 
going to hell, right here in Acts chapter 2, is what we're looking at. So the first thing is this, did he go there? Did Jesus go there? You know, the Bible says here that his soul went to hell, okay? And if you have a King James Bible, the answer, did Jesus' soul go to hell, is irrefutably yes. Right. It went to hell, okay? All other versions completely mix this up, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. They, they talk about Sheol, you know, the place of the dead, and, the, and it gets into this really weird doctrine that we'll talk about um, in a little bit. But the point is that if Jesus didn't go to hell, if David was talking about himself, that means David went to hell. So that doesn't make any sense. I mean, it doesn't make any sense that his body was in that tomb that was, you know, it was already corrupt, right? I'm sure it was just bones at that point, you know, as hundreds of years had gone by. But the point is, look at Luke chapter 23 and verse number 43. It gets into these, all these other versions that use Sheol and the place of the dead. And, and I, I didn't even look at all the different versions. I looked at a few of them. Um, but it, it gets into some really confusing doctrine, even to the point where some people teach that Christians will go to some half hell, you know, even save people. It's, it's like a purgatory for evangelicals or something. It's just like a weird doctrine that, you know, we're going to go to this half hell and that, you know, then, you know, eventually after some time, some people teach that the Old Testament saints went to the half hell and then when Jesus ascended, he took the old, it just gets really weird. Okay, it gets really weird and it's not in the King James Bible at all. Okay, look at Luke chapter 23 and verse 43. And Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto you, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 8, all that to say this, when you die, you're going to be in heaven. The Bible says that over and over and over again. Well, if you're saved and you die, you will end up in heaven in a moment. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Actually, you go to Philippians chapter 1, and I'll read for you 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 8, the Bible says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So as soon as I die in this body, the, the, it says I'm present with Jesus. I'm present with the Lord right there. Where is Jesus? He's in heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Philippians chapter 1, look at verse 21. Paul says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. You shall see that I choose, I want not, what I choose, I want not. For I'm in a straight, straight betwixt two. He's like, I'm He's like, I'm having a hard time deciding between these two things. What two things? Having a desire to depart, he's talking about dying physically, and to be with Christ, which is far better. So he's saying, when I die physically, I'm not going to some place of the dead or whatever. He's, Paul is saying, when I die, I'm going to be with Christ. He's like, when I physically die, he's like, I want to stay here and do good things and keep serving. He's like, but... I also want to, you know, if I die, I'm with Christ. It's like, you know, how can you lose there? You know, he's, he's saying I, it's, it's hard, right? But with the King James Bible, you basically have, you know, in the Old Testament, you'll hear the grave. So we'll keep talking about just being dead physically, okay? And then you'll have hell, which is that spiritual death that we talk about so much in Revelation. But with other versions, let me read you Psalm 1610 from the ESV, a very popular very popular, supposedly doctrinally sound by a lot of evangelical churches out there, including Lutheran churches. Um, I mean, we know better, but it says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. In the NIV, Psalm 1610 says this, Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. I mean, what is that realm of the dead? I mean, why are we, you know, is this a video game? <laughs> I mean, it's like, you read this stuff, you read a King James Bible for so long, and you read these other versions, and it's like you're reading a cartoon book or something. Right. It's just, it's, it's bizarre, okay? Nor will you let your faithful one see decay. All right, so like I said, some people take verses like this, and, you know, they interpret this to be some half hell where Christians will go to, and then they'll be taken to heaven at some point. Some believe Jesus took some already. Uh, you know, but look, those doctrines must be rejected for two reasons. Okay, first of all, this. Number one, they're saying the King James translators did it wrong. They're saying that the King James Bible is, has mistakes in it, is what they're saying. It, like, God didn't preserve his words correctly. 
in the King James Bible. So basically, and one of the biggest proofs of the King James Bible for me, go to Psalm chapter 12 and verse number 6. Psalm chapter 12 and verse number 6. Basically, one of the biggest proofs and kind of the only proof that I need about the King James Bible is that the King James Bible was wrong until all these modern versions you know, came about and it had mistakes and then these modern versions fixed them. That means we didn't have God's preserved word for like 400 years. We were, go we were in the dark on you know, where we go after we die for, four, for hundreds of years, literally, is what these people are saying. Look at Psalm chapter 12. In verse number six, the words of the Lord are pure words. Okay, but what if they were just, the King James Bible isn't those pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. There's your answer right there. I mean, if the King James Bible was wrong, the King James Bible was all we had for hundreds of years after it was translated and then in English, and then all of a sudden we have all these modern English Bibles coming up that start teaching all this weird stuff. Okay, the King James Bible, that's the first reason you have to reject the fact that Jesus' soul didn't go to hell is because you would have to say that the King James Bible has it wrong. Because the King James Bible clearly says that Jesus' soul, Peter's explaining that Psalm 1610, what David was talking about was Jesus Christ. It's very clear when you have a King James Bible. The second reason you have to reject this idea that Christians you know, would go to hell or half hell or the realm of the dead or whatever, it, it's one of the major false doctrines of the new Bible versions, by the way, is that Christians would ever go into any kind of damnation. I mean, God tells us that we will never perish. Amen. It literally makes massive contradictions in the gospel itself. I mean, you know, we'll never perish. How's this one? We'll have everlasting life. You know, it says that we will not perish in the most famous verse in the entire Bible, John 3, 16. So you would have to believe that we're going to, it doesn't say partly perish, it says not perish. It doesn't say, you know, you'll perish for a little bit. It says, no, you'll never perish. You will never get that second death. So it's very clear that Jesus' soul went to hell, as we read this verse in Acts chapter 2. But the question is this, why did he go there? Why did he go there? What, why did Jesus' soul go to hell? Turn to Exodus chapter 12. I'm going to give you two main reasons why Jesus' soul went to hell. Look at Exodus chapter 12. We're going to look at two um, ceremonies, two pictures from the Old Testament. Look at Exodus chapter 12. The first one is this. You know, Jesus' soul went to hell to complete the prophecies, to complete the pictures that God put forth in the Old Testament. Look at Exodus chapter 12. This is describing the Passover. The Bible says in Exodus 12 and verse number 5, it says, your lamb shall be without blemish. The lamb is many times called the Passover. The lamb itself is called the Passover. You know, we're going to eat the Passover, eat that lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it up into the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts, on the upper door posts of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. Remember, I mean, this is, this is in Egypt. They're in Egypt. They haven't left Egypt yet. God's telling them, you know, what he's going to do. And then look at verse number 8. And they, they shall, so they put the blood on the side posts of the house, and then they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, and unleavened bread, and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So they, they eat the flesh that's roasted with fire. Then verse number 9, Eat not of it raw, nor sodden it at all with water, but again, roast with fire, his head with his legs, and the, and the pertinence thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until morning, and that which remaineth of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. So they're to eat it, they're to cook it with fire, Okay, and then when they're done eating, they're to actually just burn the remains. Everything is to be just gone by morning. So look, Jesus' soul, it, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7. We know from Hebrews 10, I'll read it to you in a few minutes, that these things, the Passover, and what we're going to look at, especially in Leviticus chapter 16, there's many more in the Bible, but especially these two, they are a shadow of things to come. They are picturing what is to come. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump as, we are unleavened, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, 
Our Passover is sacrificed for us. Christ is the Passover. So everything that you see in Exodus 12, according to the Passover lamb that happens to that lamb, Jesus must fulfill that picture. It must be fulfilled perfectly. Go to Leviticus chapter 16. So we saw that they struck the blood on the doorposts, and then they ate it roast with fire, and then they, they burned it all up at the end before morning. Okay, look at uh, Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16 is talking about the Day of Atonement. We looked at this um, a couple months ago in detail, but let's just uh, review it real quickly. Leviticus chapter 16, look at verse number 23. Now, after the blood offering, we're not going to go through the blood offering. Aaron, um, the high priest, goes into the Holy of Holies. He goes through the veil. He's in the most, the most holy place inside the temple that only he can go. He's wearing the special garments. He goes and he sacrifices the offerings, and he puts their blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, okay? Look at verse number 23. After that has happened, after he has done that, the Bible says, I mean, the, the detail of the sequence of events is important too because Jesus completes that picture as well. Like nothing in the Bible is here by accident, okay? God didn't have them do this in the Old Testament because it was just something he thought of. It's like, no, this is exactly how the Messiah was going to save the world. Right here. Look at verse number 23. And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation. He's now coming out of the holy place and shall put off the linen garments, which he put on when he went into the holy place. So now he's done with the blood. He's coming out and he takes off the garments where he was in, um, inside the veil in the holy of holies, and he shall leave them there. He shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering. So remember, Aaron, Aaron had an offering for himself, a sin offering for himself, and then there was a sin offering for the people. He had a bull, and then he had one goat for the people. So his offering is, you know, the bull, or whatever he, he had, his offering. He, he shall come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the altar. It's interesting that the fat is always burned, by the way. This is just like a just interesting note. It's interesting that the fat is always burned. So you have the blood on the altar, and then you have the burnt offering. And the blood goes on the altar, and the fat is the burnt offering. And it's interesting in Leviticus chapter 7, um, I don't remember the exact verse, but you're not supposed to eat either of those. You're not supposed to eat the blood or the fat. Because they were super important, they symbolized, you know, this sacrifice. So of the sacrifices, they weren't supposed to eat the blood or the fat. Look at verse 26. He shall let go the scapegoat, shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water, and afterward come into the camp. And the bullock for the sin offering, and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall one carry forth without the camp, and they shall burn in the fire their skins, their flesh, and their dung. And he that burneth them shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water, and afterwards, afterward he shall come into the camp. We'll turn to Hebrews chapter 10. So we see the blood offering, and then we see after that he comes out and he does the burnt offerings and burns up the rest of the sacrifices. Go to Hebrews chapter 10 in the New Testament. So this is the answer right here. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse number 1. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 1, for the law... The law, Leviticus chapter 16, we're reading the law right there. We're reading, reading what God commanded them that they must do, okay? For the law having a shadow of good things to come. All the reason that God had those things done in the Old Testament, that specific way, was because they were picturing what was to come. They were picturing the things, the, the what things? The good things, the good things to come. And not the very image of the things can never those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comer comers there unto perfect. So he's saying it's not exactly like that, but they're a shadow of it. Obviously, Jesus, he encompasses everything in the Passover. He encompasses every part of the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16. He encompasses both goats, the blood offering, the burnt offering, the clothes, his righteousness. Every single piece of that, Jesus completes the whole picture, the whole thing, okay? But even Hebrews 10 goes into great detail telling us, it's like, look, it was just a picture of what was to come. Because otherwise, they offered these year by year, he says, 
And it couldn't make them perfect. But look at verse 2. It says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered? So he's saying that the sacrifices and all the ceremonies that they went through that we just looked at, it's like they didn't, they didn't make people perfect. They didn't, otherwise, why would they have to redo them? He's saying. Why would they have to do it again and again and again? Because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. He's saying, look, this wasn't the real thing. It was a picture of things to come. Otherwise, if it was the real thing, you just have to do it once, which is like, you know, you can take that into eternal security as well. Okay, but, you know, we'll talk about that um, at another time. Look at verse 3. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. God, God just had them do that to picture the Messiah and to just always keep the spotlight on their sin, to try to help them manage themselves. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Those sacrifices didn't take away their sins. They pictured the coming Christ, and they brought attention to their sins to the people. Look at verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. It wasn't good enough for God. Look at verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, the other hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. We can't be saved by the law. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish a second, a new covenant. By the which we are all sanctified through the offering. Well, here's another sacrifice coming of the body of Jesus Christ once, and for, once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Just I, I have that one sacrifice circled in my Bible. And here's why. The sacrifice, when you think about Leviticus chapter 16, the sacrifice was the whole thing. It was the whole process. It was the, the killing the goat, the blood sacrifice, the burnt offering. It was the whole thing. It was just a shadow of the real thing. And Jesus' soul going to hell, it fits all of this perfectly. It fits it all perfectly. It makes perfect sense when you look at what it was, you know, what the shadows of the past and the law were. Now, this, like, this is really controversial for a lot of people, and I'm not quite sure why. One of the biggest things people will bring up is, you know, the blood. But what about the blood? Turn to ex go back to Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 12. Let's, let's just spend two minutes on this idea like that it just, but, but we're saved by the blood. Yes, we're saved by the blood. Okay, I agree. Many people will say that, that, first of all, like the Bible says it, so that's it. The Bible says it, so that's what we believe. But people say, well, the blood, you know, like this means that Jesus' death on the cross wasn't enough. And they'll just say these extreme, extreme statements on this doctrine. But look at Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 12. The idea of Jesus' soul going to hell in no way diminishes the blood of Christ, in no way. Look at Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 12. He says, God says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt. This is the first Passover. Both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood, the blood they put on the doorposts, shall be for you a, a what? What is the blood? It's a token upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you, and I will smite the land of Egypt. So the blood was a token. It was a physical sign. It's the same with Christ's blood. It's a token. It, it covers us. It literally, I mean, there is, no, there is no remission of sins without blood. There's nothing that diminishes Christ's blood. and the, I mean, it's still there. It, it, there's nothing about Jesus' soul going to hell that diminishes the blood of Christ. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. And it just, it's, it's, a, it's still a physical token that God sees to cover the sins of the saved. It's the blood of Christ. 
There's nothing that diminishes that. But the point is, Hebrews 10, 12 says that Jesus is the one sacrifice. So the sacrifice is the whole thing. It's the entire process. Here's another thing people will say, and this is a, a kind of a silly one. But people will say, well, Jesus said on the cross that it is finished. And now you're saying that Jesus also had to go to hell? Well, it clearly wasn't, that's not what he meant. I mean, it, he didn't mean that like that's all that needs to be done because he hadn't even risen from the dead yet. Right. He hadn't even, the resurrection hasn't happened yet. Turn to Romans 10, 9. And guess what? The resurrection is part of the gospel. Guess what? If you think Jesus died, but you don't think he rose again, you're not saved. That's what the Bible says. Okay? The resurrection is part of the gospel that you must believe. In Romans 10, look at verse number 9. How many times have we said this at the door? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath what? Raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So when Jesus said, it is finished, he hadn't raised from the dead yet. So, I mean, you see, that, that, that whole argument just doesn't make any sense. And then, but this extreme idea that, oh, the death on the cross wasn't good enough. No, it was all part of the perfect plan. So was Jesus raising from the dead, and so was Jesus what? Did he stay in hell? No, he came out of hell. Now, here's the logical reasons. I mean, it logically makes sense as well. The logical reasons for this are, are pretty clear. We deserve hell. Right. We deserve hell, and Jesus died for who? For us. He took the punishment for our sins. Jesus was the replacement for us. So it makes sense that he went there. It makes sense that he went there. Turn to Romans 5.8. I mean, the Bible says in Romans 5.8, it says, Christ died for us. So what Jesus did was for us. So it makes sense that if we deserve hell, that Christ would need to go there if he was the replacement for us. Okay, now here's, uh, here's you know, two kind of we're in opinion land by pastor right now. But here's, here's two other reasons that I believe that Jesus went to hell. And I mean, I think these are pretty strong opinions, but turn to Luke chapter 16. It, it completes, look, it completes the picture of the Bible. That's, that's the first thing. It just completes the picture of the Bible. There is no reason God didn't do anything by accident in all these specific detailed ceremonies that he had, especially the Day of Atonement and especially the Passover, they pictured Christ, and this completes that picture. Look at Luke chapter 16 and verse number 26. We're talking about the rich man and Lazarus here who went to hell. So the rich man went to hell, Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom, which is heaven. Okay, so you have one man in heaven and one man in hell. Look at verse 26. And the man in hell is saying, get me out of here. He's like, I don't want to be here anymore because he, he opened his eyes and he was where? Immediately he was in hell. Look at verse 26. And he says, beside all this, he's like, Abraham says, I can't get you out. He's like, besides all this, he says, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. It's like, Abraham's saying, I can't go to you. He's saying to him, the rich man's saying, get me out of here. He's like, I can't go there. I can't go there. And then he says the other way. He says, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. He says, you can't get out. Now turn to Revelation chapter 1. So if you die and you go to hell, if you're not saved, if you don't believe on Jesus, you die and go to hell, anybody dies and goes to hell, they're there forever, for eternity, forever. It's eternal damnation, just like we have eternal life, okay? But look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 18. Look what the Bible says about Jesus, though. Look what the Bible says about Jesus. Look at verse number 18. It says, I am he that liveth and was dead. So Jesus, this is Jesus talking. He's explaining to John. This is who John is seeing. He's saying, I'm Jesus. He says, I'm he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And, and what? And have the keys of what? Of hell. Jesus, look, Jesus came, Jesus went to hell so he could show he could come out of hell. It's the same thing. It's the same, it's the same idea behind the physical resurrection. He, I mean, why couldn't, you know, why couldn't Brother Ryan die for my sins? Other than the fact that he has his own sin, he can't come back from the dead. Nobody can defeat death except God. 
It was this huge proof that Jesus could physically rise from the dead. He's God. He's the only one that could do that, to defeat death and the devil that way. But guess what? He can also come out of hell because he has the keys. He's the only one that could go there and come back out because he has the keys of hell and of death. Okay? He came alive physically, which no one can do, and he also came out of hell, which no one can do. It's just another proof that he's God. The defeat of the physical and the spiritual death. Wouldn't that make sense? That Jesus has to defeat both of those things because that's, that's what we both, we face both of those things. As sinners, as people who are condemned, we face a physical death and we also face that spiritual death. Jesus defeated both because he has the keys. That's what he meant in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 18. Now turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Here's another reason. Um, you know, this is kind of my, this is kind of my opinion um, here. I mean, I don't think there's um, too many um, different, there might be a few different opinions on this. I have no idea. But 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 18. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18, kind of an obscure verse in the Bible. But I also believe that it fits perfectly this idea of why, one of the reasons why Jesus went to hell. One of the things he did there. Okay, look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. The Bible says, For Christ hath also suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. That's us, right? He's the just, we're the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. There's his death on the cross, but quickened by the Spirit, by which he also, by which also, by, you know, the Spirit, you know, by, by, by the Holy Spirit, he also went and preached unto the lowercase spirits in prison. Okay, so it says, by the Spirit he went down to hell, or in to, to preach to the spirits in prison. Now, when you look at the word spirits in the New Testament, most of the time it is talking about, like, evil spirits. Somebody possessed by a spirit, possessed by a demon. Sometimes it's talking about the Holy Spirit, you know, capital S. Sometimes it's talking about, like, someone's life or their soul, like their spirit came back into them. Uh, Jesus raised somebody from the dead. But it's mostly talking about evil spirits. When you see that word spirits in the New Testament, it is never a way to just talk about people. It is never a way to say there was 50 people in the field or there was 50 spirits. You never see it used that way. It's always talking about, you know, some sort of spiritual thing, mostly evil spirits. So here it says, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. This is something that he additionally did you know, instead of, you know, he had died in the flesh, and then he additionally did this. Look at verse number 20. We get some more clarification here. So we're seeing it, it's, some, it's some type of spirits. You know, most of the time it's evil spirits. But look at verse 20. You know, demons. By evil spirits, I mean demons. But many times it's talking about somebody, it's not talking about a physical body is what I'm trying to get at. Look at verse number 20. Which sometimes, so these, these spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient. So at one time, it's not saying sometimes, it's saying sometime, at one time, at, at one time before, when once, it's talking about back in the past, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein a few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So he's saying, which sometime were disobedient. He's talking about the spirits that he was talking about in verse 19. Okay, when he says, we're disobedient. He's talking about disobedient spirits of verse 19 that are now in prison. He says, the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. We're talking about disobedient people that are now spirits in prison, disobedient people from the days of Noah, disobedient people from the Old Testament. That's what I believe this is talking about. This is talking about the souls of disobedient people, the souls of people who did not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, Think about this. When Jesus died on the cross, who was in hell at that time? When Jesus died on the cross, was there nobody in hell? No, every single person that had died up to that point in history that did not believe the gospel was in hell, was a spirit that was in hell at that time. I mean, why is any man in hell ever? Because he didn't believe the gospel. Look at Romans chapter 4 and verse number 3. You say, what about the Old Testament? People were in hell in the Old Testament, just the same reason they're in hell today. Because you're saved by the same gospel. Abraham was saved by the same gospel, except in their case, it was the promise of a Messiah. In our case, it's belief on a Messiah that's already come. 
That's the only difference. That's the only difference. But it's belief in the same promise. And if people were in hell, they didn't believe that promise. Look at Romans 4.3. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham what? Worked for God. Abraham uh, served the Lord with his life. And it was counted for him for righteousness. No, Abraham believed God, and it was counted, for, counted unto him for righteousness, the Bible says. Look, Abraham believed the gospel. The people that were in hell at the time Jesus died on the cross were the people that had already died physically that didn't believe the gospel. They didn't believe God. There's lots of people in hell. And I believe, this is my, this is my opinion, I believe that what 1 Peter 3 is talking about is Jesus went down there. He said, hey, here I am. He preached. What did he preach? I don't know what he said. I mean, I'm not going to add to the Bible, but what was Peter preaching? The gospel. He went down and he, he, he told the disobedient, you know, he basically proved that they were wrong. He proved that they should have believed God. And then he left hell. So they knew. I mean, that's just my, that's my opinion on 1 Peter chapter 3. But look, Jesus' soul going to hell fits everything that we see in the Bible. Right. It fits perfectly. It does not take away from the suffering on the cross. It does not take away from the blood that covers our sins. It does not take away from any... People say silly things like, oh, God can't die and all this. I mean, just... It, these over-the-top extreme like, positions on, you know, on, on that side of things are... <clears throat> it's odd. It's odd. The Bible says it. If you have a King James Bible and you believe the King James Bible is the Word of God, th there's no other conclusion you can come to. And it fits perfectly. It makes perfect sense to us. And it just it fits, it fits the whole Bible. It fits together like a, like a perfect puzzle. Now, let's talk about soul winning just for one second. Because I know um, this comes up. Here's the thing. I don't mention it soul winning. I don't mention Jesus going to hell soul winning. Now, I'm not against you if you do, but the reason that I don't, I used to. I used to. But the reason that I don't personally, it's kind of the same reason I don't go into like a detailed preach fest on the Trinity out soul winning. is because it's kind of like, I mean, is this, is this simple doctrine here? I mean, this is kind of like 300 level, 400 level class stuff. We're looking at Old Testament, you know, ceremonies and how it's a shadow, a picture, a prophecy of David, all this stuff. So... To me, if I have to have, I mean, I'm running across people more and more lately that, you know, in the last couple of years that they don't even know who Jesus is. And you don't need to, you don't need to believe that Jesus went to hell to be saved. Okay, you know, I have a friend from back home that he doesn't believe that Jesus went to hell because that's what his Bible college taught. And, you know, he's not a heretic. He's not, doesn't take it to any extreme, weird, half hell stuff. He just wasn't taught that, and he doesn't believe that, and I just choose not to argue with him about it. And he's just as saved as me and you. But the point is, if I have to get somebody to go two miles out soul winning, you know, they have to come from zero belief to belief in the gospel, I just, it's an extra mile I don't want to have to take them. That's all. Uh, but it, it's not wrong. It, it's not wrong um, to do so. It just, um, it's just another bridge for people to cross. That's all. So that's why I don't do it. If you hear me soul winning, you hear my soul winning presentation. Um, we always want to be thorough soul winners. Um, if, you, if you do it, you want to bring it up, I, I don't have any problem with that. Um, it's just uh, I don't, and that's for that reason. It's just, you know, for the Trinity, this is what I say in the Trinity. You know, God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. That's, that's what I say as far as the Trinity goes. I know there was some, you know, heretical Trinity stuff that came up a few years ago. And then you started seeing people out soul winning, just like giving the detailed trinity to everybody at the door. It's like, it's not, it's not necessary. They get into church, they will learn these deeper things of the Bible. Okay? It's not, you know, Jesus' soul going to hell on its own is not a salvation issue. Okay? It's not a salvation issue. But, let me say this. Like all other small doctrines, like all other small doctrinal issues, the pre-trib rapture is a perfect example. You can come to this church if you believe the pre-trib rapture. There's no issue with that. But the problem with a lot of these, like all of these small doctrinal issues like this, is they can be taken to serious error. They almost always, if you drive them to the end, 
they almost always lead to large error. Like this one, for example, it will lead you to like the King James Bible isn't true. I mean, that's a problem, right? That's a problem. If you think that the King James Bible, you start going into this and you start thinking the King James Bible has errors in it, yeah, we got a problem at that point. Okay, so it's not on its face a salvation issue, but it can lead to larger um, things. Just like the pre-trib rapture can lead to all kinds of weird dispensationalism and weird stuff where people aren't even saved. Okay, but that on its own is not. Go back to Acts chapter 2. So, again, I hope, uh, hope that kind of clears up that issue. It's pretty, I mean, it's pretty clear in Acts chapter 2, you know, if you don't go into the study of why it is that way and God, why God made it that way, it's pretty clear in Acts chapter 2 that it did happen, okay? And, you know, many, you can just accept that on your face and it's not on its face and just not um, get into all the detailed, complicated stuff about it. But Jesus' soul went to hell. I mean, it's very clear in the, in the King James Bible. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 32. Peter continues. He says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being on the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David, again, he's, he's proving again that this is not David. He says, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sitteth on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. He's talking about Psalm 110. You know, David reiterates this statement. He's saying he's not talking about David. He's like, he's not talking about David here. He's saying in Psalm 110, 1, it says, The Lord saith unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. David was prophesying in that verse about Christ. And Peter points that out. Look at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel... Now he's just speaking to them directly. He says, Let the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom, again, <laughs> whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? So Peter gives this huge like doctrinal expose on David being a prophet and Jesus' soul where it went and everyone was just like... They're just like, what in the world? They're going crazy, right? He basically says he was the Messiah. He goes and he re redefines. Turn to Luke chapter 24. This is a proof of Luke 24 right here. He re redefines what even they thought they knew about the Old Testament. And, this, and think about this. This is Peter. This is Peter. We're in Acts. We're in the second book of Acts. And this is Peter. The disciples are, most of the time you read the Gospels, the disciples are completely confused on what Jesus is talking about. All of a sudden, we get to the book of Acts, and like, bam, Peter's just like, he's like firing out like, just like crazy doctrine. Just like this deep doctrine of the Old Testament. It's like, what, I mean, you notice, have you, do you notice a difference in Peter? Do you notice a difference in Peter? Well, it's Luke 24 and verse number 45. That's, this is, this, Acts chapter 2 is fulfillment of this verse right here. Luke chapter 24, look at verse 24. 25, or uh, 45, sorry. Basically, this is, Luke 24, 45 is right before Acts chapter 1 starts. Okay, so it's right before Jesus is taken up. But then look what Jesus does here. He says, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. He, Jesus, like, gives them understanding of everything right here. And this is why you see a difference when you read the Gospels, next time you go from the Gospels to Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, just make a note. Just be like the new Peter. Luke chapter 24, verse 45. Because this is clearly, a, I mean, the guy just ran off, went fishing. When Jesus raised from, Jesus was raised from the dead. He knew it. And the guy just ran, I mean, he was a mess. He was a mess. But Jesus opened their eyes to the understanding. They just, they just, it just like, it just, he made it click for them. He made everything click for them. Very similar to what Jesus did with Paul, in, in my opinion. But look at, verse, um, look at verse number 39. Let's finish up. We're running short of time here. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all, all that are afar off. No, I'm sorry, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So here he says, he says they were pricked in their heart, and basically he stirred up the whole crowd and there's two choices for this crowd now. There's two choices. 
And Peter says, repent. You know what Peter says? He's, he's, he's beseeching them to change their mind. He's beseeching them, hey, believe what I'm telling you right now. Believe these things about Jesus being the Messiah. Repent. He says, for the promise is unto you and to your children that were afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And 1 Timothy chapter 2 says he, he wants all to be saved. It's God's will that all would be saved. And many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they, now, now we see the two groups. Then they that gladly received his word. So we see people that receive it. It's the same thing we see today. Some people receive it. They were baptized, and that same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So he gets 3,000 people saved here with this sermon. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Look at verse 44. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, even as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord, in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. All that to say this. I'm going to get into the details about this, but they got saved and they got with the program, these people. They got with the program. They, I mean, they sold, they had all things in common. Look, this wasn't forced communism. It's just this was voluntary. They want to be uh, part of the church. They're all in unity. The only thing I'll say about this now is that this, I mean, we'll talk about this particular, um, in a couple chapters, we'll talk about this particular act that this church was doing. But let me just say for this evening, this church had unity right here to the point where they didn't care anything about their possessions, nothing about anything. It was just forward with the gospel. That's all it was. They were all in one accord to, I, I believe to a degree here, that we can't even probably comprehend as Americans, this church. So, Jesus, um, Peter gives a great sermon on Jesus here. He gets 3,000 people saved, and he preaches the doctrine of Jesus' soul going to hell, which makes perfect sense in the Bible. It fulfills everything that needed to be fulfilled about the sacrifices from the Old Testament, and it makes perfect sense in the Bible. I'm not sure why people have such a hard time with it. But with that, that's Acts chapter 2. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.